so I'd like to start from a specific type of sensor which is the acceleration sensor uh, also called accelerometer accelerometer that is typically pretty common now you should you should consider that of, of course you know that the acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time and uh, uh, from the point of view of sensors it is pretty common to have a position sensor so to measure a position in different ways on, on outdoor on a large scale one can use uh, for example a GPS or one can use uh, real uh, let's say uh, point position sensors to measure the position in, in an indoor space in a smaller space there are many possibilities and then from the position one of course could uh, make a first derivative and then a second derivative and obtain the velocity and acceleration that is easy in principle in practice is not usable because uh, when you do perform a derivative you typically uh, increase the impact of uh, noise and disturbances and therefore you lose precision in the measurement so it, it's very uncommon to extract the velocity and the acceleration by performing derivatives of, of the position Okay, the only typical case in which one does that is, uh, for example, outdoor. If one is on a car with a GPS, then in that case you are in a large space at large velocities, then noise is less important. If you have from the position measured with the GPS at precise times, you can obtain the velocity. Okay, that is typically doable. But if you, I don't know if you, if anybody of you runs or does some jogging. If you do it, even if when you, when you when you when you're running, the instant velocity is uh, terrible with the GPS. So it, it's something that can be done in large spaces at large velocities. But uh, I mean, no noise becomes uh, um, very soon very important. So the other situation is that of obtaining directly the acceleration if one wants to, to have the acceleration which is of course very common for for uh, appli typical applications of uh, mobile phones but it's also useful to have the acceleration because you can in principle integrate the acceleration and then obtain the velocity from a first integration and the um, position from a second integration okay again in principle this can work in practice it doesn't because if you have a, a certain if you have an error let's say a, a displacement error on the acceleration um, uh, I missed the adjective, it's called um, systematic error on the acceleration, a drift. Then when you integrate, this drift too is integrated and of course you make an error in the velocity which is increasing linearly with time and in position you make an error which is increasing quadratically with time. So it can work but for very... Um, for... for, for very specific situations and you always need to be able to recalibrate very often the velocity or the position in order to let's say reduce the error which increases with time okay so this is just to introduce the topic but let's look in particular at how one can uh, let's say directly sense the acceleration uh, Okay, let, let's look first at the uh, principle of operation and then uh, we, uh, we look at how it is actually embodied in a, in, in, in a typical situation. 
Okay, the, the first thing to um, understand is that, as in many cases, one has to first transform the acceleration in terms of uh, another quantity, which can be more easily m translated into an electrical signal. Uh, this is typical for many quantities that we want to measure. In this particular case, we first have to transform the acceleration in a displacement which is a position, a, a variation of the position with respect to reference point, and then the displacement can be transformed in an electrical signal. Okay, so this is the uh, mechanism. We go from acceleration to a displacement, and then from the displacement to an electrical signal. Okay, let's look first at this, uh, this operation going from an acceleration to a displacement is a transduction. So we need a transducer to that because we are changing, uh, let's say, uh, an energy from a form, which is a um, w w w which is um, um, in this case a force an acceleration to a displacement which is typically an, uh, an elastic energy in a spring so what we need in order to do that we need a mass which is actually called inertial mass or proof mass. Then we need a spring. And in addition to that, we need some damping. So damping is, uh, in, in Italian, is a smorzamento, so something that can in practice suppress the oscillations of the spring. Now, the situation is the following. Let's assume that we want to measure the acceleration to which this particular box is uh, subjected. This is just the principle of operation. Let us assume that y is this, uh, uh, the, the position of the box. So the acceleration that we want to measure is y second derivative with respect to time. So we want to measure the acceleration of this box. Within the box, we need to put, um, of course, in, we're just considering one direction. So it's a one dimensional accelerometer. Just to keep things simple, then it's relatively easy to, let's say, uh, increase the number of dimensions. So we have a spring which is defined by its elastic constant and we have, uh, the spring is, is uh, let's say, fixed to the case, to the box on one hand and on the other hand it's connected to this mass, this inertial mass which can be a ball, a metal ball or, or a silicon box, a silicon um, part in practice. And then we can have some damping that we can, let's say, indicate like this. This is like a piston with some oil so that it's hard to push it up and down, okay? So let, let us look at the forces that are acting on the, on the, uh, on the system. Uh, we have uh, a position of the mass with respect to the box. Let's call it X. And then we are going, f f uh, le let's assume that uh, uh,
okay this is okay so what is the uh, for, for for probably it's more common okay let's assume that the uh, um, that x0 the position of the for simplicity the position of the of the um, spring when there are no for there's no force applied is zero so the spring if there is no force applied would be here just for for simplicity so what what we have as uh, forces here we have of course a force of the spring which is kx that is pushing the mass in the direction of negative x so because the spring is extended and is pushing the mass to towards negative x x of course and then we have uh, the uh, damping here the damping that is uh, exerting a force which is uh, uh, let's say breaking the mass so if x is increasing we have a velocity which is moving towards positive x then the damping is acting in this direction with a force that is proportional to the velocity of x so we have minus kx because the sign is negative here and then we have minus bx prime for the damping force so the total force applied to the mass is equal to minus kx minus bx prime so force of the spring plus force of the damping and of course this force according to newton's law is proportional to the mass times the acceleration of the mass okay the acceleration is uh, the position of the mass uh, uh, derived with respect to time two times so the position but with respect to an absolute reference system so it would be x plus y so we have x second derivative plus y second derivative because the box is moving okay so if you look at the situation uh, so this is the expression just consider this situation let's assume for a moment uh, that we have no damping and we have no spring just to check that everything works if we have no damping and we have no spring then the force is zero and this means that the acceleration must be zero of course it means that the the box even if the box has some acceleration the mass cannot be accelerated so x to prime x the, the second derivative of x plus the second derivative of y must be zero so from the point of view of x we see that the mass is going toward if y is, is uh, if y is uh, is accelerating is so the second derivative of y is positive then we have that the second derivative of x is negative in the sense that the mass is accelerating towards the box in the negative direction this is of course what we expect so x is a displacement is the displacement of the mass with respect to the box and y is a is the acceleration that we want to measure so if we, we need to extract the displacement as a function of the acceleration this is exactly what we wanted to do so you see in order to do that we need just to have a spring a mass and a damping system so let me um, make a Laplace transform of everything so I can write here Laplace transform of that equation so I have minus kx big x minus b s big x now the s is not the stimulus it's just the 
variable of the Laplace transform, then this is equal to um, uh, the mass times S square X minus A, which is the quantity that we want to measure. So of course, now the situation is relatively easy. We can put here X and then we have M S square plus Kx, no, plus Bs plus K is equal to Ma. And of course, we have X is equal to A times M over M S squared plus Bs plus k. Of course we can divide numerator and denominator by m and then we have 1 and then below we have s squared plus b over m times s plus k over m. So this is a transfer function so we have, uh, of course, the system is linear. We have that the displacement is a function of the acceleration and uh, the transfer function in terms of Laplace transform has two poles. So the situation is here, you have uh, right, this is plus, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that is not really important from the point of view of, of uh, the, the evaluation. Of course, it, 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 it's a minus, but of course we need to, I mean, have a, a clear relationship between uh, the displacement that we measure and the acceleration. So we have two poles. The, the, the quantities are, are the coefficients of the denominator are positive, so the poles have a real uh, negative part. And then we can write uh, the following uh, transfer function in a simpler way. We can uh, uh, write here something like two Uh, omega 0 s plus omega 0 squared when we basically have defined omega 0 as uh, square root of k over m just to compare this just this is just a definition of quantities and then we have that uh, 2 key omega 0 is equal to b over m so this is a definition of key which is b over 2 omega 0 m so by using this definition we can write the transfer function in this way so I it's also easy to plot the uh, bode diagrams of the transfer function because uh, uh, we of course have two poles the poles have uh, um, in, 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 in practical cases uh, the, the poles are uh, um, conjugate complex poles the modulus of the poles is omega zero and the damping uh, factor of the poles is key so we can have uh, this body diagram if we plot x over a in db we have something like this this is omega on a log scale and then we have omega 0 here and of course if you remember the body diagram we have a, a constant region here and then we have uh, A slope of minus 40 dB per decade and then here we can have a peak which is 1 over 2 key in dB. So 
so this the height of this peak depends on key this flat part which is the part that we like to have because in this region we're going to perform the measurement because you, 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 you see that in this part x is proportional to a and the proportionality constant if we look back to this situation is uh, uh, is uh, uh, k over m is k over m in db so it is known okay this is the resonance frequency of the accelerometer and of course it dip if you consider the situation the resonance frequency depends on the constant of the spring and on the mass uh, in a typical accelerometer you have that number that is given and you know that if you want to perform your measurement you need to stay below that frequency because below that frequency you have the proportionality relationship between the displacement x and the acceleration L. okay now this is the first part uh, all the accelerometers work uh, on that principle I mean the ones that are not integrated uh, that, that, that are uh, s simply done in, in uh, uh, small mechanical uh, parts and the ones that are done on silicon uh, such as the ones that are used now uh, they all uh, behave uh, on this basic principle of course this is just one dimension if you want to have uh, as in the case of the present day accelerometers three directions you want to measure the acceleration along the three axes then you need to have uh, three uh, three structures like the ones that I've shown you e one along each direction typically one needs to uh, let's say uh, repeat the same type of measurement one can transform the three directions in t in, uh, of the acceleration in terms of three different displacements and then one has to measure the three displacement in the sense that has to transform the three displacements into electrical signals okay now let's look now at this second part how we transform a displacement in an electrical signal the typical um, mechanism is using capacitive accelerometers you know that if you have a parallel plate capacitor the capacitor is inversely proportional to the distance between the two parallel plates so essentially we are transforming this displacement into a distance between two parallel plates and therefore when we vary the displacement we vary the capacitance so we need to have two components typically you have one component two components <coughs> one plate of the capacitance is a stationary plate stationary plate which is let's say connected connected to the housing which is this the, the box that I have described before in which you have the accelerometer the box of which is solidal to the 
to, to, to the acceleration that you want to measure that is fixed and then you have a moving plate which is uh, a moving plate which is the plate uh, attached to the inertial mass Okay. Of course, if d is the distance, d is the distance between the plates, if you remember the formula of a, capacit of a parallel plate, of the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, c is uh, uh, you remember is proportional to is equal to the dielectric constant times the surface of the parallel plate divided by the distance so we, we just look at the functional relationship with respect to the distance this 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 c is inversely proportional to the distance between the plates okay um, it's use, it is useful to have such a dependence because you need to take into account that in practice the displacement is now very small. If we consider a normal uh, accelerometer that we have, for example, uh, inside a phone, the displacement is just a few tens of microns. So 10, 20 micron. delta d the displacement is just 10 20 microns so we have very small displacement and and the cap the, the fact uh, that we have uh, an inverse relationship between displacement and capacitance allows us to let's say in, in, increase the effect of having uh, a small displacement now uh, uh, as you can see uh, since uh, the, this relationship is not linear and we have a, a small variation of the distance uh, in, in typical situations two capacitors are used in order to let's say uh, as we shall see remove the second order effects to suppress the second order effects which might be relevant we use a second capacitance let, let, let's look at the at a typical situation we have something like this we have an inertial mass no let me use a new sheet so typical situation cross section we have an inertial mass here something like this this is a cross section this is a silicon piece a silicon a silic it's almost a membrane is suspended can vibrate this is the mass So, have something like this. And these are springs. So, this is a single silicon piece. And then on top of it, we have a, the stationary plate on top which is uh, w w which we call a cap because it is on top of everything so this is let me use a different color uh, this is the inertial mass this is the cap is a station oops no uh, the stationary plate and then below it we have a uh, uh, another capacitor
let's call it a base the cap and the base are stationary they're fixed and the inertial mass can vibrate okay if we look at the inertial mass from the from the top this is just the mass seen from the top just to understand the degrees of freedom that we have typically the, the this is the central mass which is which, which can move and then in order to let it move here we have some uh, we have some uh, room here again uh, just to use the same color okay before it was black so this is the the mass we have holes these large rectangular holes in the middle So you, you, you need really to imagine that this is a silicon membrane. W when you have all these holes, basically you have a central mass which is connected to the outer part just through these uh, small thin parts which actually act as springs. Okay, so it can vibrate vertically. And this is exactly what you want to measure so you measure here the acceleration along this direction vertical direction the membrane can move up and then the, you have a positive according to this sign displacement you reduce the distance with respect to the cap and you increase the distance with respect to the base so you increase the higher the top capacitance and decrease the bottom capacitance or you can move you have you can have a negative displacement and in that case you reduce the distance with respect to the base so uh, the, what we needed are the spring the uh, mass and we have and we have the um, the damping and the damping here is just air because of course the mass vibrates in air and so it's like a pendulus which has some damping because of the presence of this gas so from the electrical point of view we have uh, two capacitances in series we have a capacitance from the cap to the mass this is the cap and this is the mass so this is CCM is this capacitance you see it's also visually a parallel plate capacitor and then we have this capacitance from the mass to the base and this would be CMB let us assume that this is delta 1 uh, d1 this is d2 the distance if we have a displacement d uh, no displacement let, let, let us call it delta as before if the displacement is delta then we have that uh, uh, from d1 we have a d1 minus delta and d2 becomes d2 plus delta okay so the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance so the capacitance uh, between cap and mass is inversely proportional to d1 minus delta and the capacitance between mass and base is proportional to 1 over d2 plus delta 
So one capacitance increases while the other decreases for a positive displacement and the opposite occurs in the case of negative displacement. So again, let's just repeat the situation. A as I mentioned, we have more transduction mechanisms and then finally a sensing mechanism which finally requires some electronics in practice. So we need to transduce the acceleration into a displacement, then the displacement into a capacitance, and then, of course, now a capacitance is already an electrical quantity. We, we can translate the capacitance into a voltage, the variation of capacitance into a variation of voltage. So we need to make to have a capacitance <coughs> voltage transducer. And this is pretty typical. Let me just show you an example. There are many ways of doing that, but let me just show you an example. Essentially the principle is the following we need to apply a, a known voltage to a capacitance. If the capacitance changes then and the voltage is known, one has a change in the charge which is stored in the capacitance. And then we have to pick this charge to move it away and to put it on a known capacitance so that this charge translates into a voltage that we can measure. Okay? So because we cannot directly measure a capacitance. Let me repeat, we take this capacitance, we want to know, to measure a capacitance. We apply a known voltage to the capacitance so that we have a charge which depends on the capacitance. So from the charge we can obtain some information on the capacitance. Then we have to move this charge on to a known capacitor so that the charge translates into a known voltage that we can measure easily. Okay? So, in the end, we can measure the voltage from the, vol the, final vo the voltage on the non capacitance. From the voltage on the non capacitance, we can obtain the charge of the non capacitance that we have taken from the unknown capacitance, but we knew the voltage on the, known, on the unknown capacitance, and then we can extract the value of the capacitance. Okay, let me go through each step. So, this is known. We apply a known voltage on this circuit here. This is one phase, let's call it phi1, phi1, and this is phi1 negated. Then we pick this point and we pick this point. And then here we have the These are the capacitances of the accelerometer. I use the same name, CMC and CMB. This is the accelerometer.
Okay. It, it, it's easier than it seems anyway. So let's look at what, what we have here. Uh, so th this part this part serves to discharge C because this is CF, this is known. Okay, so CMC and CMB are not known. I, these are the capacitances that we want to measure. We actually want to measure the displacement, but of course these are not known. CF is known. I, we might need to completely discharge CF, and you see that when phi 3 negated is 1, then CF is completely discharged because this is 0 from the virtual uh, short circuit and this is 0 2 so le le let's look at the two situations that we might have so first situation phi 1 phi 1 is high so phi 1 negated is 0 when this happens you can see that this goes to e and CMB goes to zero. So we are in this situation. So phi one is equal to one. Phi one negated is equal to zero. Let, let me just go through redrawing the circuit. We have E here. Here we have CMC. Here we have CMB. And this is zero. This point goes at the input of the operational amplifier and then we have this part and then we also have in this situation phi 2 that is high so it's a short circuit the negative input is short circuited to the output and also CF is discharged. Also, phi three is negated is high. Okay. Yeah, probably I need some more space. Just I want to finish this part at least. So, uh, what is happening here? let's look at the voltages in this situation this is zero this is zero this is zero because you, you have a virtual circuit at the input of the operation amplifier and the output also is zero then cmb has zero and zero so it's completely discharged okay then here we have e right so we have a charge on this capacitor which is q here we, that is equal to e times CMC okay and we have it also here minus Q so here we have Q equal to E times CMC okay just is important to look at the charge on the various capacitances so this capacitance is discharged because it has zero voltage on both ends so we have zero and zero so basically when did this q came from essentially q came from the output along this way the output of the amplifier provided the charge that goes into the capacitance cmc that's it there is nothing more to add okay now what happens if we are in the other half period when phi one phi one goes to zero let me use a different color here phi one goes to zero and then we have something like uh, the following then if phi one goes to zero you can see that the the opposite happens is cmb 
that goes to E and CMC that goes to zero. So we are in a different situation. We have zero here. This is CMC. Then here we have CMB. And here we have E. And then the circuit is more or less the same. So uh, let me write here. Phi one, phi one is equal to zero. Phi one negate, not phi one is equal to one, of course. What happens to the rest? Phi two is zero. And phi three is uh, phi three is one, so phi three negated is zero. So everything changes here. So uh, what happens here? We have the amplifier, and then we have this situation. CF is here, and it is connected to the output. And then this is the quantity that we want to measure V out, the output of the amplifier. Okay, now let's look at this situation here. Let's consider now the voltages applied. Here we have zero. Here for the virtual short circuits have zero too. So this is completely discharged. You know CMC had a charge Q. Now in this new configuration, this charge has to go away. Okay? Where does it go? Of course, we have something here because here we have E and here we have zero. So there is a charge Q1 which is going here, and therefore we have a charge minus Q1 which is going here. And then on this node where we had the charge minus Q before. We need, to, we need to have a charge minus Q because this charge cannot go anywhere else. We have all capacitances. So this, the charge that was minus Q has to go. This is zero. This is minus Q. This has to go here. Minus Q plus Q1 must be here. So here we have minus plus Q minus Q1. OK? Because the sum minus Q plus Q1 minus Q1 must be minus Q as it was before. So from the configuration one to configuration two, the charge on that node can't go away because the node is only connected to other capacitances. So the charge cannot escape. Okay. Once we know the charge on this capacitance, of course, we know also the voltage because V out is the voltage on the capacitance CF and therefore V out is equal to uh, CF no sorry is equal to Q1 Q minus Q1 over CF by definition okay Let me repeat, V out is the char is the voltage on the capacitance CF and therefore is the charge on the capacitance CF divided by the capacitance, by definition of uh, capacitance, right? So you, you see exactly what I, did, what I said before. We apply a known voltage E on the unknown capacitances we obtain a charge Q which is unknown and then we move this charge on a known capacitor which is CF and then we obtain a, a voltage which is of course proportional to the charge that is unknown which was in turn proportional to the capacitance that we want to measure so let me uh, wrap everything up I, I'm just copying what I obtained so we have C, uh, we have V out 
is equal to q minus q1 over cf but q was cmb times e minus cmc times e which is then divided by cf so we can put e out, out of the parentheses we have cmb minus cmc over cf this is the thing that we measure this is known this is known so once we have the voltage we can obtain the difference between the two capacitances and therefore we can obtain the displacement okay if you remember cmb was proportional to one my is, is some let, let's put the proportionality as something like k1 kmb the constant divided by d1 minus delta cmc is a different constant because of course the situation is different the, the, the device is different divided by d2 minus delta and then cmb minus cmc are equal to kmb divided by d1 minus delta minus kmc divided by d2 minus delta if we are able to make uh, the these uh, terms identical if k m b divided by d1 is equal to kmc divided by d2 this is a matter of uh, uh, adjusting the geometry then cmb minus cmc you shall see is going to be proportional to delta to first to second order is proportional to delta if these two quantities are equal then you can make a second order expansion with respect to delta that is the small displacement and you shall see that the zero order is zero the first order exists and the, with respect to delta and the second order with respect to delta is zero again so we have that the different the capacitance different is proportional to delta and therefore v out is proportional to delta so when we, the delta is the displacement which is proportional to the acceleration as we said before so we have the voltage at the um, at the output of the operational amplifier which is proportional to the acceleration of the membrane okay and this is the physical mechanism that is uh, uh, let's say working inside an accelerometer so the concept is pretty simple we change we translate the acceleration into a displacement the displacement into the capacitance the capacitance into a voltage and we keep track of everything until we have a voltage which is directly proportional to the acceleration okay now just the last five minutes to show how we pass from a 1d accelerometer to a 3d accelerometer then what i uh, said before is something that is happening in one direction we have this membrane which can move uh, in the vertical direction then of course we want to use uh, uh, planar silicon technology to build the membrane this is a particular technology which is called micro machining uh, it's called micro machining and this specific accelerometer is called the MEMS accelerometer MEM stays for micro electro mechanical system okay it's micro because the membrane is uh, a few hundreds micron typically smaller than a millimeter is electro because of course we are measuring electrical quantities such as a capacitance and it is mechanical because we have moving parts because the membrane is moving 
Now, uh, the, the technology for fabrication of micro machines is a planar technology. It's derived from silicon technology, basically. The, the standard silicon process which are optimized in order to have moving parts so it, everything has to be planar if you want to make uh, a 3d accelerometer typically we have something like this we have looking from the top now we have one membrane which is vibrating vertically which is the one that i shown before this is vertical vertically vibrating and then we need to obtain so this is the direction which is out of the sheet and then we have uh, the other two directions top and uh, the, the vert vertical direction this in this uh, on this screen and the lateral direction of course we need to apply something different we and we have something like this it typically we have uh, a sort of honeycomb in the lateral direction we have a fixed membrane such as this and the moving and moving plate in this direction and we have the same thing occurring in the other direction so let's assume that the blue is moving no no the blue is fixed and the black is moving this is moving and the other part is fixed This is fixed. This is fixed. What? Like this. The direction in which they move is this one. A again, the, you, you have to imagine the size is a few hundreds micron and the displacement is just uh, a few microns in this direction. So the black part can move and uh, the blue part is fixed. And then we have a third one which is oriented in this direction, so it's moving this way. So in one case, we really have parallel, plot, parallel plate capacitances in the vertical direction, while in the lateral direction, we have uh, again parallel plate capacitance, but each parallel plate is made with several fingers. So the, the, the parallel plates are the lateral faces of the fingers summed together okay so on a single piece of silicon we have the three moving membranes okay each of them translates into a, to a different displacement which translates into a different uh, let's say variation of capacitances which is then uh, let's say extracted separately okay <laughs> I don't know, let me just, because I did not use this, uh, just want to show you a picture of the, of the thing. No, I'm, I'm showing you ne ne next time when we continue. So we have the same thing in the other direction. Then. We shall discuss it uh, next time, uh, tomorrow then. Okay, done. Thank you.